The Monday Men, a local jazz group, plays at Villains Bistro every Monday night to help keep jazz alive in the city. Adam Dondrea tells us more. With a market that can seem overrun by synthetic pop stars drenched in auto-tune, some may say that jazz is dead. However, walking by Villains Bistro on a Monday night would suggest otherwise. Villains recently became the new home of the Monday Men, formerly known as the Monday Milkmen. For almost 10 years, Windsor's prominent jazz group called Milk Coffee Bar Home. Now, they invade Villains every Monday night to delight listeners with a unique blend of funk, jazz, and rock. The band, which consists of Katie Moore on saxophone, Brad Merrifield on bass, Adam Thompson on drums, and sole remaining founder Philip Whitfield on keyboard, guitar, and vocals, have undergone countless lineup changes over the past decade. In fact, according to drummer Adam Thompson, they've had three members come and go in the last three months, but that hasn't changed the goal of bringing their music to downtown Windsor. As long as you give them a stage and an audience, the Monday Men will continue to alter the shape of jazz to come. Reporting for Mediaplex News Now, I'm Adam D'Andrea. After this year's disappointing season for the AKO Fratman, Rob Bennion sat down with head coach Mike Lachance on another edition of 5 Minutes With. I'm Rob Bennion and today we're spending 5 minutes with Mike Lachance, head coach of the AKO Fratman. Coach, can you tell me a little bit about the season t uh, this year? Well, it was, it was disappointing. I mean, we got off to a really good start. Um, started out 3-0. and uh, We've seen the problems that were there. We might have faced some lesser competition uh, in the league almost a fortuitous schedule, um, so to speak, but uh, nevertheless, we were 3-0 and and, and looked good, and um, we, we hit the hard part of the schedule and kind of faltered a little bit, and um, a, lot of our, uh, a lot of our faults were brought to the forefront, and we ended up 4-4, four and, four and we missed the playoffs. It was disappointing. Any time at AKO when you miss the playoffs, it's a disappointment. Any time you're a 500 team, you missed your mark, so it was a failed season, and, uh, and we'll look for bigger and better things next year. Three games into this season, dating back to the start of last year, you were on an 11-0 and uh, stretch. What was the uh, what was the difference maker the rest of the way? Well, you know, um, from 2011 to 2012, we lost a lot of key athletes. Uh, a guy like Bo Lumley um, wasn't back in the backfield. We lost three starting offensive linemen, and our offensive coordinator had been changed. So there was a lot of changes on the offensive side of the ball. And, and when we played better opponents, I think it showed. Um, like I said, our, a lot of our faults were kind of brought to the to the forefront, and uh, teams exposed us a little bit offensively, and we had our time moving the ball. And um, when you have a hard time moving the ball, it doesn't matter how good your defense is. And our defense was terrific um, from the start of the season to the finish. And uh, it didn't really uh, it didn't get us over the hump because our offense couldn't do their part. You went to the uh, championship game a year ago. And coming into the season, uh, a lot of big talk about the defense being the best in the country, uh, going back to the championship game and, and with, <clears throat> excuse me, winning it this year. Um, over Overestimate the team a little bit, or do they not perform up to expectations? It's hard to tell. I mean, I don't think we overestimated the defense. We, we had the best defense in the country uh, statistically, um, least points against uh, against our defense. Now, we gave up some on specials. We gave up a few on offense, so it kind of skews the numbers a little bit. But if you look at pure defensive stats, we only gave up seven drives over 50 yards all year. And that's pretty incredible in an eight-game season to not even give up a drive a game. So I think defensively, we're right on the mark. Offensively, we maybe we overrated a few guys, but I think injuries kind of proved uh, costly. Um, we went through five or six running backs during the course of the year and just couldn't get that running game consistently going. And when we finally did get it going, our passing game kind of fell off a little bit. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe we overrated a few guys, but uh, maybe we didn't coach them up so good either. You may or may not have uh, quarterback Christian Hackney back next year. He struggled at times this year. Um, if he is back, what does he need to do better? And if he's not coming back, where can you find a, a better replacement? Well, you know, uh, at AKO, uh, we deal with young athletes, 22 and under, and we try to help them uh, move along if they want to. If he wants to go play in the CIS, I'll be the first guy to help him out, and I'll be more than happy to do so. And certainly Christian's capable of playing at the next level, at the university level. Um, whether he wants to or not, I'm not, I'm not sure. We haven't had our, our year-end meetings yet. But uh, if he's back, uh, he's just got to play with more confidence. I think he lost a little bit of his swagger this year. Um, he had that in 2011, really played with a lot of confidence, and, and it showed. Uh, this year, when things went wrong and kind of went awry on offense, a lot of pressure fell onto his shoulders, and he had a hard time dealing with it and adjusting to it. He's a young guy, uh, 20, 21 years old, and uh, a lot of pressure on him. And 
it's not the easiest thing in the world. Quarterback's the toughest spot to play, and uh, the kid is a cognizant kid. He wants to be great, and he really puts a lot of effort into it. So I can feel for him, and I think he can be great at our level or, or in the university. Um, if he's not back, you know, we'll look for the next one. As you mentioned uh, earlier with Bo Lumley leaving, Hackney lost his safety blanket a little bit. How much did that affect his, his psyche? I would have to think it affected him. I mean, it affected me, so I think it would affect him. You lose a guy like Bo, and Bo was the top running back in the country, uh, consensus All-Canadian, uh, consensus Rookie of the Year, uh, just a terrific player, one of the better guys I've ever coached, uh, and a young guy too. And, you know, um, you lose a guy like that, it's tough to rebound. Uh, he was a guy that uh, we could rely on for 200 yards a game, and there's not many people like that in the country. You're going to be losing some more players offensively uh, this coming year with the graduation of guys like uh, Joel Archer and, and Derek Hurst. Yeah, um, we lose good players this year. We lost good players last year. We lost good players 50 years ago. So when you have a graduation age limit of 22, you're always going to lose good players. And usually your 22-year-olds are your best players, so it makes sense that you're going to lose good ones every year. But Hamilton will lose good ones. London will lose good ones. Burlington will lose good ones. It's, we're no different than anyone else. We just have to reload. How much is it uh, Windsor needing to reach the level of the Hamiltons and Londons and Hamilton and London needing to come back down a little bit for you guys to catch them? Well, I don't want them to come down at all. I mean, I think we're as good as them right now. We just didn't show it at times this year. I think we were a, well, probably fair to say we were a 6-2 and two team that gave away two games late in the season. Uh, certainly the London game being up 17 nothing at half, it's inexcusable to give that one up. And in Montreal, we we're up 8 nothing and up 8-7 with five, six minutes left in the game. So. I mean, we got to hold on to leads. We got to hold on to the football. We would have been a six and two team. We would have walked into the playoffs with a pretty good uh, record and on a good roll. But um, I don't think they're going to come down at all. They got two real good organizations that you just mentioned, and, and we're a third that's right in that group. We'll rebound. You mentioned uh, usually your 21, 22 year old guys are the the best of your of your team. Uh, who do you see from from this year's group of younger guys stepping into that group next year and, and taking on a bigger role? Well, certainly Mason Beekus and Anthony McDonald are two guys that come to the mind right away if they, if they choose to return. Um, and they've got some university aspirations, but if they choose to return, they're going to be two of the best players in the league. Those are the first two guys that will probably come to my mind. Any predictions for next year? OFC Championship. Uh, I mean, that's what we set our goal at every year. That's what we set at this year. It's disappointing we didn't get there, but you know what? There's, uh, there's another season ahead of us. Thanks for your time today, Mike. We've been talking to head coach of the AKO Fratman, Mike Lachance. The NHL and baseball are the big topics on this week's Sports Talk. Hi, I'm Alice Hewitt. Welcome to another edition of Sports Talk with our experts Kenton Wolfe and Rob Bennion. First things first, the Tigers are on the verge of going to the World Series after eight and a third strong innings from their horse, Justin Verlander, in Game 3. What has been the key to the Tigers' success this postseason? I'll tell you what, Rob. It's been uh, strong pitching and uh, really timely hitting. Gotta agree with you. The pitching staff's been outstanding so far, led by, uh, obviously, their horse, Justin Verlander, eight and a third strong innings in Game 3. Only gave up the one run in the top of the ninth. And uh, just, just outstanding work from the staff. Anibal Sanchez has been great. Max Scherzer's been unbelievable. Doug Fister does what Dougie does. Uh, the only blip on the radar so far has been Jose Valverde closing. Seems to have lost the job. Gave up uh, four runs in the ninth inning the other day. But uh, other than that, the pitching staff's been uh, unbelievable. And uh, like you said, timely hitting from a couple guys who had some rough seasons this year. Yeah, a couple guys really stepped up offensively in, in Young and Peralta. What do you think? Delman Young was almost on his way out of town this year. Tiger fans were not pleased with his, uh, his performance at the dish. Uh, he's their designated hitter, and he wasn't hitting. Um, but he's he stepped up in the postseason. He's got a whole bunch of home runs, a whole bunch of RBIs. Uh, he's actually become one of the leaders all time for the Tigers in RBIs and home runs in the postseason. He's only been here a year and a half. I think that's pretty incredible. And uh, Johnny Peralta... Not known for his range at shortstop, but he's been making some good plays in the field, and he's been carrying the team with the bat as well. Yeah, tomorrow, uh, game four, uh, Yankees are playing Sabathia. How do you think the uh, Tigers are going to respond? Well, this is the Yankees' best shot to get back into the series. Sabathia is obviously their ace, left-handed hurler. He's got a lot of great stuff. Uh, Max Scherzer, though, on the other hand, great stuff too. Uh, I think it's going to be a great game, another pitcher's duel, like all the games have been so far, and uh, I think it's going to be the best game of the series. The NHL released its latest CBA proposal, and they made significant concessions. Do you think they will be able to save the season now? You know what, I said on this program last week I wasn't optimistic for the season getting started at all this year. Um, NHL made a lot of concessions with this proposal, and you know what, I, I am feeling optimistic now. Yeah, if the players don't take this deal, they're out of their minds. I think this is a deal It's bad for uh, GMs with a lot of changes as far as uh, cap hits goes and uh, the salary cap, but this is great for the players, 50-50. I don't think it's going to get much better than this. You know what, the NHL kind of came out swinging with their first proposal a couple months ago. They wanted the players to uh, roll back from 57% of hockey-related revenue to 43. Obviously, we've now met in the middle, hopefully, and I think this is the deal that's finally going to get it done. 
I think the, one of the biggest changes is their uh, their idea to bring a third party arbitrator to uh, player suspensions is a big uh, big change. What do you think, Rob? Well, that's something obviously players uh, had a big issue with last year was well, Shanahan was the the big dog on 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 campus. Uh, kind of, he was in charge of handing out the suspensions, and then if he needed to appeal, it went to Gary Bettman, and Gary Bettman's not going to overrule Shanahan. So. Uh, a third party, neutral third party, hopefully coming in to oversee the proceedings uh, if it gets to that stage would, would be beneficial, I think. Yeah, this would have really helped a guy like Rafi Torres with a 25 game suspension. A lot of people didn't think was all that fair once it was appealed to Batman and it only got to uh, 24 games. So uh, I don't know what you think about that, but uh, another big change is a five year cap on, uh, on player contracts. What do you think? I, I, have to, I have to agree with that. I love that. I think the 15, 17 year deals we've been seeing are ridiculous. There's nobody that wants to play that long in the same city, I don't believe. Um, there's uh, there's guys like Rick DiPietro who signed 15-year deals and then played 30 games with their team. Um, I just think it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's really going to hurt a lot of teams like uh, Chicago and Vancouver who have signed guys for 12 years, and it's going to change uh, the way those cap hits affect the, uh, the salary cap. You know, I thought something was interesting was the NHL had always said they don't want to do their negotiating publicly. They prefer to do it behind closed doors with the PA. And uh, they actually released their list, uh, proposal, made it public, and so kind of a change in, in negotiating tactics. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a, uh, a plea to the fans. I think to this point, fans for the most part have been on the, uh, the player's side. But with this, if, uh, if the players don't take this, I think the, uh, all fans will pretty much be 100% behind the owners. Absolutely. It's been the big bad NHL since the lockout started. Fans have been blaming the, the, the league. But I think this is a, a major, major concession, a major step forward. And the, the league is saying, look, fans, we want you back. Let's get hockey started on time. Let's play a full 82-game schedule. I'm Alice Hewitt, and thanks for tuning in to another edition of Sports Talk. NHL hockey has been on a hiatus, but the OHL is in full swing, and fans are thankful. Jessica Brisebois was ringside. Some give thanks to Good Harvest, and others give thanks to watching Good Hockey. Dedicated Spitfire fans sit in the stands at the WFCU Center on Thanksgiving Day to watch the Windsor Spitfires take on the Sarnia Sting. The crowd arrives sporting the hometown colors. The coordinator of fan development for the Windsor Spitfires, Nathan Salon, has been with the Spitfires for three seasons. He is responsible for selling season tickets, group tickets, and multi-game ticket packages. He said the demographic of fans vary. They are anywhere from two right up until, until seniors. We have a lot of season ticket holder seniors, um, and as well we have a lot of season ticket holders that are youths. Um, on Sundays, we draw a lot of families because it is a Sunday afternoon game at 2.05, perfect time for families to come out to the rink. Team captain and defenseman for the Windsor Spitfires, Severio Poza, said keeping a positive outlook on the bench helps build confidence on the ice. So many negative things happen out on the ice. I mean, the last thing they need is another guy harping on them and bringing more negatives into it. But uh, I found that, you know, it's easier to play with a lot of confidence and when things are more positive, especially on the bench, then uh, confidence booms for everybody. Despite a rough couple games, Poza said playing good hockey and pleasing the fans is important. I want to be that guy that everyone remembers as, you know, a good leader of this team. Um, you know, I'm a, a big spiritual guy, so I really want to be somebody like that uh, people feel comfortable coming to, whether it's players or just people in the organization. So uh, hopefully um, I'll have a big impact and a name that will be remembered around here. It was announced at the game 5,283 fans were sitting in the crowd. Selen said the WFCU Center is a great place to bring the family. For the Mediaplex News Now, I'm Jessica Brisebois. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Dana Poisson and this is Mediaplex News Now. Mediaplex News Now is a production of the St. Clair College Journalism Program.